Good afternoon and welcome to Unbox Lunch. Before we get started, please know that this event is being recorded. I'm Jenny Williams, Associate Director of the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian Institution. And we are thrilled that you are joining us for lunch, which I'm enjoying here at our headquarters in downtown Washington, DC. The Archives of American Arts National Collector, Josh T. Franco, will soon join us from his office just down the hall. Before we get started, um, a few housekeeping items. At any time during the webinar, you can submit your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the control panel on your screen. Closed captioning is available. You can access captions by clicking the CC button on the right side of the control panel. Um, today's event is all about the newly acquired papers of artist Ramir Cardillo, and we're lucky to have um, him in attendance. So Ramir, um, please chime in throughout the chat. Now I introduce and welcome the National Collector of the Archives of American Art, Josh T. Franco. Hey, Josh. Hi, Jenny. Took me a second to unmute. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, like Jenny said, I'm the National Collector here and happy to be talking about um, the addition, recently uh, accessioned addition to the Ramirez Cardio papers. Um, just to give you some background and hi Ramirez out in the audience, uh, like Jenny said, please feel free to add any um, comments in the chat. And uh, yeah, I look forward, these have been really active in the chat and I've enjoyed that, so it's great. Um, so, yeah, Rimer Cardillo is an artist who was born in uh, Uruguay in 1944, um, went to school there as well as in Germany at a couple of institutions and has um, lived in New York State and city for um, ever since. Uh, so these papers measure five linear feet total. The addition is four linear feet. This is one of those, a linear foot is this box, that's why I'm pointing to it. Uh, this is one of those ideal situations where the collection began with a visit to Rimer in a studio upstate, uh, for which the hand-drawn uh, plans are here in the collection. I'll show you those. Um, and discussion and identification of, you know, what the papers, what papers are, uh, which is always the first conversation I have with an artist. Um, and then uh, just staying in touch over the first year or so. Ramirez's papers are were unique in that there were you know, multiple locations in New York at a studio, but also in uh, some in storage in Uruguay. So um, it involved travel uh, or doing things during travel for Rimer, and we appreciate that very much because um, this material not only illuminates Rimer's career and art making and life, uh, but also is one collection that illuminates um, the Uruguayan diaspora to the United States. Uh, I want to mention in that vein, Naul Ojeda, who's another artist whose papers we have and which are in fact fully digitized. You can explore that collection online um, from your home. Um, and I believe Penny Ojeda, who was married to Naul, is um, here on the chat as well. So, and Naul and Rimer were great friends. Um, and lucky, luckily, Penny is here in DC. So when Rimer visits, uh, I get the chance to see um, both of them at once. So hi to all the friends out there. We'll get started by diving in. So let's start out with the photograph, right? So you um, know the person we're talking about. And I'm going to jump into this folder. Again, what you're seeing right here, you know, this is a new collection. That means it's unprocessed. So while it is available to researchers, they would be encountering it in this um, original kind of organization we received it in. And within a year, a couple, year or two, um, our processing archivists will get to it and do their beautiful organizing job uh, of it. So here's a photo of Rimer, a great uh, labeled in handwriting um, annotation that gives us a location and a year, a city and an institution. So if you've watched a lot of Unbox, you've heard me talk about research value. That's a lot of good research value at that top line there. Um, and yeah, this is Rimer in Berlin. So like I said, his uh, early art education was in Uruguay and then he went to do postgraduate work um, in Berlin. Oh, and Fanny Simeon's here as well. Uh, Fanny, whose oral history was recently completed. Hola, Fanny. Gracias por estar aquí. Here's a little sketch. 
in this folder as well. So all of these things will be, like I said, again, organized. This paper, I think, will probably require some interleaving uh, to protect from acids and decay. Okay. So you saw that great photograph, which I love. I do want to give some context um, using the papers for uh, you know, you know, a huge factor in why Uruguayan, not only artists, but people um, were compelled to go to different places in the world uh, at the time in which Romero went to Europe and then came to the US. Also, it's just a nice example of a press clipping. So, this is a clipping that the donor, in this case, Vermeer, um, cut out of the fuller publication. So it's not as thick as that and marked up. So we know what to look for. So, you know, printed material um, ends up in as part of collections all the time. Uh, it's great when we sort of, especially if it's from a publication, you know, such as The New Yorker, which is uh, otherwise ubiquitous, easily accessible. Um, has its own archives that can be accessed by researchers. But in this case, um, you know, it's like, why is this here? That would be the question the archivist would ask and what I asked too in my initial assessment. The annotations make it really clear why, you know, it shows you on the table of contents where to go, mentions Uruguay at top. top. Um, in this particular case, it's pointing to an article by Lawrence Weschler. Uh, writing about political conditions as a group of journalists, uh, one of a group of journalists uh, writing about political conditions all over the world. Uh, this is a 1989 issue of the New Yorker. And again, this is really helpful. The, uh, really, the really relevant part, what, why Rumer was compelled to keep this clipping is marked with this red box. Uh, but I wanna read this paragraph because it, it helps uh, it really telegraphs <laughs> why Romero ended up here as well as many other um, Uruguayan folks and Americans. Um, during the ensuing 12 years of the dictadura or dictatorship, Uruguay was transmogrified into what, according to Amnesty International, was the country with the world's highest per capita rate of political incarceration. By 1980, one in every 50 Uruguayans had been detained at some point and detention routinely involved torture. One in every 500 had received a sentence of six years or longer under conditions of extreme difficulty, and somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 Uruguayans were, went into exile, Rimer among them. Comparable percentages for the United States would involve the immigration of 30 million people, the detention of 5 million, and the extended incarceration of 500,000. So that's heavy, but I think important context um, for understanding uh, why this particular group of people and artists um, are part of the United States and therefore within the scope of the archives of American art. And it's of course, lovely to learn history through a document that an artist has um, handled and identified themselves as part of their papers. Also the author is Lawrence Weschler, who uh, for, in my own scholarship has been an important source for thinking about the artist, uh, Robert Irwin, but he's written about so many artists and movements. Um, so that's just a nice connection too. So I'm just going to jump into a box. I did do a little pre-marking this time. Uh, yeah. So Rumer is uh, very dedicated to the practice of engraving. So here's a little sample of what I mean by that. Let's see if I can. So you can see that's the back. Um, and I think this is an attempt at sort of uh, a mark for stationary. Um, you, a researcher could look into the folder this is in to see the context. Um, but I encourage you to look at Rumer's work with paper. Uh, I'm trying to catch the light. There you go. You can see the impression really well that way. Josh, we're getting a question about um, just your use and handling of the material and maybe sure. you could comment on why we, you're not um, using gloves in this instance. Uh, that's a good question and really good actually while I have this particular piece of paper in hand. So gloves um, totally make sense and are appropriate to use for things like paintings and sculptures. So if you went over to the conservation areas at our colleagues at American Art Museum or the Hirshhorn or the Portrait Gallery, um, you'd certainly be handed gloves. Uh, paper, however, is different in physical nature and gloves um, 
can tear, the fiber of gloves or even the plastic of gloves can tear at the microfibers in paper and exacerbate damage to skin, clean skin, of course, I did just wash my hands. Um, clean skin is better for paper. And I think this demonstrates those microfibers really well, because you can see even the edge here, those are all the kinds of um, surface textures that glove fabric would catch on to and um, tear. Great question. Okay, and I know what was here. So correspondence, of course, is a huge part of the archives collection and what researchers come to spend a lot of time with. Um, Ramirez papers have a lot of correspondence from family and friends and people in the arts world. Um, this is a great, <laughs> this is of course Picasso on the front uh, and a postcard. And this says, uh, Rimer, que es blendido. El catalogo, uh, handwriting is always difficult. Something else is maravilloso. So really just laudatory postcard in response to receiving a catalog for a show. Um, the signature says saludos Susana. And there, I, you know, a researcher <laughs> and me, if I wanted to spend um, kind of extended time with this collection, my initial guess is that Susanna Torueya Leval, who's been an amazing supporter of um, artists uh, from Latin American diasporas in the US for many, many decades. Um, and there is a file of correspondence with her full name on it elsewhere in this, this collection, which leads me to believe that. So I knew they, they know each other. Um, Ramir, if you want to say anything more about your friendship with Susanna or working relationship, um, I'd love to hear about it. Oh, and this is interesting. So there's a couple of these documents, kind of fancy folder envelope things labeled IBM. Um, this is one of those mysterious, this is I'm really putting myself in the, the shoes of the processing archivist. Um, so this is IBM. It looks like something that you would have and use if you're an employee, it's an employee personnel folder. Uh, Ramir, I don't know if you worked at IBM, um, that'd be interesting. But then in the envelope uh, is this smaller, you know, more standard envelope. And the correspondence, I looked at it a bit earlier, is from uh, a biennial in Poland dedicated to engraving. And it's, uh, there's a letter here as well. And this is, um, thanking Ramir for sending uh, prints to the seventh international print biennial in Krakow. Uh, they accepted two prints for a related fair, I guess, Intergraphia 78, um, and confirming that he'll receive a catalog. So in an IBM folder, smaller envelope about a uh, Polish biennial and engraving in this confirmation. So why I'm, you know, why it doesn't make intuitive sense at first while why this is you know, if this biennial is <laughs> related to IBM at all, um, but I'm also not gonna just sort of make a decision on my own to remove it from that because this is what we would call original order. So I'll leave it there. Uh, and then the processing archivist will have to ask themselves that questions too. And if any of our archivists are on, I'd love to know your first impression of that and what how you might handle um, cataloging that when you get to it. Okay, another thing we can talk about that can be really explored through um, Ramirez papers are some really key exhibition history moments in the United States. Um, and before I talk about this particular thing, I'll just note that Rimer represented Uruguay in the 2001 Venice Biennial. Um, so that's one kind of important exhibition moment and has uh, had other important shows as well and been part of them. So one thing that, this is a show that's near and dear to my heart. Um, this is just the folder and I'll get into it. But this folder was generated, was sent by Chan Noriega, the curator of the exhibition, uh, Revelaciones Revelations, Hispanic Art of Evanescence, which was held at the Herbert F. Johnson Museum 
located at Cornell uh, in Ithaca, New York in 1993. Um, this is a folder sent in 1994. We love a date at the archives and we have that here. Sort of a debrief individualized to each artist um, from Noriega. And I'll get into this, but also want to note that uh, largely because of the activity of Daniel Joseph Martinez in this exhibition, it's become a, a kind of a, you know, just a really significant exhibition. Um, and there, I think the scholar, art historian Sonia Gander might be on this call, who's an expert in that moment um, as well. So it's significant enough uh, that the records of this show are their own sort of capsule collection and Stanford special collections. So you can go uh, to Stanford, the Finding Aids online, I was exploring it this morning. Um, and there's eight linear feet donated by Chan uh, of his curatorial files related to this exhibition. So- Josh, um, yeah. Romero says that he created a very large work that was hanging at the exterior of the museum. Yeah, and this- For folder, this particular thing, exhibit that you're talking about. Yeah, and there's great photographs. Thank you, Chan, for sending these to Romero and Romero for sending them to us. I'll um, show you that, that work here. Well, here's a group, just groups of the artists together. And I'll just name the other artists. It's an amazing group. Uh, Celia Alvarez Munoz, Maria Brito, Rimer, Ron Gonzalez, Gronk, Daniel Martinez, Amalia Mesa Baines, and Rafael Montañez Ortiz. So um, a really crucial moment in art history. So yeah, maybe Rimer, you can here is, I think the sculpture on the ground and the images on the wall are both yours, if you can confirm that. And here's people at the installation. So these are great he says yes. Okay, and great. A quick question about the size of this collection. Um, if you could speak a little bit about to his papers. The size, yeah. So uh, as I said, this edition is about four linear feet. The whole collection is five linear feet. The first installment was a few years ago and was mostly printed material. And um, we call that a seed collection. Uh, it's sort of a manifestation of a mutual commitment between the archives and the artists, because like I said, a lot of this material was in Uruguay, so it wasn't gonna come quickly. Um, I think I visited Rimer first in 2016, possibly even 2015. Um, so again, if you've seen a few unbox and heard me talk about this, you know these conversations always take a while. And actually four or five years is not so long. Um, it's pretty, this was a very smooth process besides the international travel involved. So here are some black and whites. Oh. And then I know there's some other photographs back here they are. Yeah, so here's a shot without people. You get a clear view of the work. And this is, I don't know if, if people are familiar with the Johnson, but this um, interior roof here has been filled with uh, a light installation by the artist Leo Villarreal for uh, quite a few years now. Um, I believe it's still there. If anyone from Cornell Sonic can confirm. Um, so just as an institutional kind of history document, it's interesting to see the Johnson uh, without the Via Real installation in that spot. And here's a great view of the piece on the ground. Romero is saying that the work is printed on canvas and that the cone is of soil and stones. Amazing. And it's also a mound, That's which beautiful. even, um, you know, Romero, I think we were lucky some of me and some of the staff from the archives walked down to your exhibition at the um, Organization of American State, the Museum of the Americas, as it's called here in DC, that show you had in 2016. And there um, were a lot of mounds. You know, this is 93, even from documents from before this. Uh, that's something I find in your work is the mound, the, you know, the mound shape um, is a form you work with a lot. Here's a great shot of those.
And then one last one. Oh, these are great. So these are just really good installation. Oh, there you go. Uh, documents and this work was, you know, a temporary work. You wouldn't see this if you went to the Johnson today. Um, so it's just so key to have this kind of documentation for works that are uh, temporary and site specific. Oh, Sonia confirmed, yes, the Villarreal is still there. Thanks, Sonia. Okay, let's see what else we find. Josh, another question from the audience. Yeah. Um, or, and maybe it's for Romare, but are there any of his um, pieces as part of the Smithsonian collection, perhaps at the Smithsonian American oh, Art Museum? That's a good question. I don't, I mean, that would be easy enough to look up quickly, but Romare, if you have any works um, in the Smithsonian artworks, that would be either Hirshhorn American Art Museum, possibly the Portrait Gallery. Uh, I don't know if you've made many portraits, um, but I don't know. It's a good question. Um, this is, again, I just really appreciate it. says no. Okay. Uh, well, maybe they're watching. Um, I just appreciate, researchers would appreciate annotation like this uh, on documents, which of course is certainly not expected um, of people to go through their, you know, trove of papers and do that kind of work. It's a lot of work, uh, but I appreciate it when it happens. So this letter, which I just also love the uh, signature being a thumbprint and the name El Supremo. So at the bottom, there's a handwritten note that was I, pretty clearly written later uh, that tells the reader, the researcher, Este es Oscar Ferrando, um, an art artist in Uruguay and director of the Club de Gravado, the engraving club in Montevideo. And I think being a member of that club in Montevideo and a I don't know if you were founder, Remer. That was um, you know, part of Remer's earliest artistic formation was being part of this engraving club in, uh, in Montevideo. Okay, let me pull a different box. Oh, okay. This is great. So this is extra special because I've been to this place. So this is Rimer, a hand drawing sort of layout of uh, Rimer's current studio, I believe still current studio um, uh, in upstate New York. Um, this is the address I know I visited. So I believe this is, uh, and this is clearly a document related to commissioning the stonework. Um, Romero, did you end up working with Mitch Hinton on your studio? We'll Romero says that that is um, still a studio location. Yeah. Right. And, and yes, he did more. work. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So this was a successful bid, um, a business card doing its job. Let me see if I can read some of these notes. Oh yeah, so it's even, you know, it's measurements and prices. So this is figuring out, I assume, how much the masonry would cost for this, for instance, 20 by two and uh, two, 20 foot by two foot, two inch section, $800 to do. Um, Mike to bring more rocks tells us this note here. So understanding artist studios is something we do a lot of. I think the last unbox was Susan Schwab. <laughs> uh, we also looked at interior shots of her studio. Uh, Romero says, I still need them. I don't know if you mean the rocks of this document. If you need the document, I can send you a scan, Romero. Um,
Okay, I know what I was looking at here. All right. Um, artist writings. So Romero's been the subject of uh, a number of publications. Uh, I think many of which I placed in the art library here to complement the papers. Um, this is a manuscript that could have been for a catalog or perhaps unpublished. The title is uh, Unos Complejos Grabados, dot, dot, dot. I don't know if that title rings a bear remember. There's a handwritten version and a typescript. I'm going to pull this out very delicately. Love to see a typewriter page. Romero oh, actually, says this, that yes, it's by Jose Pedro Abu. I was about to say that. So yeah, so this is by um, somebody else about Romero's work. So Josh, we have a few minutes left. Maybe you can speak a little bit about the, you know, just the significance of, of having um, Romero's collection. Um, you know, well, like I said, it's uh, at the beginning of Romero's career on its own, as it very much fits in our scope of collecting, um, considering, you know, we didn't talk much about his teaching, which has been a huge mm -hmm. part of his life, um, right. primarily at SUNY New Paltz. And there's some great documentation related to that in the papers as well. Um, so, you know, there's always, we love thinking about that generational transfer of knowledge and understanding you know who taught who who was whose student um, so those part that part of these papers um, are really useful for understanding the generation following Remer uh, that he had a direct impact on um, you know his contribution his representation of Uruguay at the biennial uh, his work in engraving I think last time with Susan Schwab you know we talked about silver point and metal point I think engraving is another one of those mediums that this paper, this collection will keep present um, in American art going forward. Um, and, and then like on top of it, just that layer of diasporic uh, international politics history that is an mm -hmm. implicit part of these papers. And, you know, we didn't get into correspondence. Again, there's a lot. And just like in Noel Ojeda's papers, a lot of correspondence. And you, when you read them, you really get a sense of, um, you know, I remember in Noel's papers, one of the heartbreaking letters when somebody was writing to him, uh, who was, they were still in, in Uruguay and talking about having to choose between art supplies and affording meat, you know, for instance, or, or not even being able to find meat to buy um, when they could. So, you know, there's really human moments live here and they also do that thing that um, I'm always eager to point to about demonstrating how porous uh, the idea of America is, much less the idea of American art. So um, just thank you for adding to that, Rumer. And uh, yeah, yeah. No more questions. Or maybe we're at time. Well, wow, that flew. I think we are at time. It goes yeah. quickly. So thank you, Josh. And thank you, Rumer, for joining us. And also thank you to everyone else um, for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the program and it was as informational for you as it was for me. Support from friends like you makes programs like Unbox Lunch possible. We hope you'll consider making a gift to the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian. To donate, visit aaa.si.edu backslash support, or you can email me at williamsjl at si.edu. My colleague, thank you, Sarah, has entered in that um, contact information into the chat. Thank you all again for joining, and we hope that you'll tune in for our next Unbox Lunch, which is scheduled on February 18th, and will feature Jacob Proctor exploring American large-scale sculptor, excuse me, Elaine Zimmerman's papers. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, and happy birthday to my nephew, Luca. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.